Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's nice to see uh, everyone here on this lovely South Bend afternoon. Um, I'm Philip Munoz. I'm the director of the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this afternoon's lecture. Uh, a few thank yous and then uh, announcements before we introduce our speaker. Um, first, uh, thank you to, uh, we have several of our fr the friends of the center here. Uh, I won't name you um, or call you out by name, but thank you so much for uh, making events like uh, today possible um, or deeply. Uh, I am deeply grateful in Notre Dame, uh, uh, deeply grateful to you. Uh, an announcement. Uh, a week, uh, I'm sorry, on Tuesday, uh, next Tuesday, the 29th, we're having what I hope to be the first of a series of Lincoln-Douglas debates. Um, I uh, told uh, someone in the dean's office about this idea, and they loved it. Uh, and then I told them what our first debate was going to be, and they loved it a little bit less. Um, <laughs> here's the resolution. Resolved, legal access to abortion is necessary for the freedom and equality of women. Uh, we have two phenomenally bright young women here to debate that uh, subject, um, including Zan DeSanctis, a Notre Dame graduate, recent Notre Dame graduate. She writes for National Review. And Jill Filipovic, who is an um, a extraordinarily thoughtful uh, pro-choice speaker. So join us. That's going to be next Tuesday. It's at 7 o'clock in the Cary Auditorium. That's in, uh, in the library. Now, um, as my students will know, uh, the Lincoln-Douglas debates were uh, 60 minutes for one side, 90 minutes for the other side, and then 30 minutes uh, for, the, for the first speaker. Um, uh, I didn't think you could actually tolerate that. So <laughs> it will be shorter, but in the same format. I think we're going to do 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and 25 um, minutes. So it will be Lincoln-Douglas uh, style debate, and it should be uh, really a first-rate conversation. So please join us next Tuesday, 7 p.m. Uh, that will be live streamed as well for those who uh, can't be on campus, uh, you can join us online. OK, to the topic at hand, um, one of um, the very best elements of being the director of the center is to bring in some of the um, brightest minds uh, in the country. And I've been looking forward to this event for quite some time. Um, I uh, have admired Professor Hamburger um, uh, for a great deal of time. We work in similar areas of constitutional law. Uh, the other extraordinarily fun element of this job is working with our undergraduate students, especially our Tocqueville fellows. And as you know, our fellows introduce our speakers. So I'm going to introduce Joe Durrill, who's a sophomore, con studies minor, right? Con studies minor, good, good. And uh, he'll in introduce Professor Hamburger. Thank you. Philip Hamburger is the Maurice and Hilda Friedman Professor of Law at Columbia University. One of the nation's preeminent scholars in constitutional law and its history, Professor Hamburger teaches and writes on wide-ranging topics, including religious liberty, freedom of speech in the press, academic censorship, the regulation of science, judicial duty, administrative power, and the development of liberal thought. In two recent books, is the administrative law unlawful and the administrative threat. He argues that, that the administrative state is unconstitutional and a threat to civil liberties. In his latest book, Liberal Suppression, Section 501c3 and the Taxation of Speech, he shows that the Revenues Code's restrictions on the political speech of churches were initially proposed by the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan and shows that these speech limitations are unconstitutional. In 2014, Hamburger established Columbia Law School's Center for Law and Liberty, which studies threats to and legal protections for freedom. He is also the founder and president of the New Civil Liberties Alliance, an independent nonprofit civil rights organization based in Washington, DC, that uses litigation and other pro bono advocacy to defend constitutional freedoms from the administrative state. The title of today's lecture is How to Protect Free Speech from Big Tech. Please join me in welcoming Professor Philip Hamburger. Is that working? Excellent. 
just showing that we're all living, not with tech, but in tech, right? It's, we are profoundly dependent on it. And I should begin after that introduction, that very kind introduction, um, to say that I'm not just here as an academic. You know, often academics travel and give academic talks, and we parade our views as if they really mattered. Um, here, I think we're all on an equal footing. We are all equally under uh, the control of unelected bodies that are private bodies. Uh, they're not our government, um, but that nonetheless have great power over us. And we're wondering, can I read that? Can I say that? What am I not getting? What can I not say? Uh, and so we're all here on equal footing wondering what to do. It's not as if any of us have any special status in figuring this out. We have to work it out together, not just in this room, but as a nation. Um, so that's what I want to talk about today. Can free speech be protected from big tech? Uh, big tech censorship is really an important problem. It may not have seemed so even five years ago, but by this time, I think we all understand there's a lot going on here. Wherever you stand on the subject, it matters. But can anything be done about it? Uh, now, at the outset, uh, I like to be very candid about things. Uh, that's that's not, say, not to say I'll say everything on my mind. I think that's inappropriate too. Uh, but when I do speak, I like to be candid. And I should begin with a confession that I'm not an entirely impartial observer. Um, I just have to move this chair for a minute. Pardon me. There. That's more comfortable. Now, uh, why am I not entirely impartial? For one thing, there's the reason I've already mentioned. Uh, I love ideas and intellectual engagement, and I suspect everyone in this room does too. I therefore find censorship distasteful. The idea that any individual or group of individuals can decide what I can read and what I cannot just rubs me the wrong way, let alone what I can write and what I cannot. It's anti-intellectual, it's oppressive, and it's a return to the 17th century. I love studying the 17th century. I don't want to live in it. And that's the problem we face. But that's not all. I have a more direct interest in the subject about which I think I should be candid. I was somewhat involved in drafting the anti-censorship bill that eventually was adopted by Texas last year. That was largely by accident. Tech is not my field. <laughs> Anyone who knows me knows that I'm just mentally competent for that. I'm just not smart enough for that. Um, and I didn't have any interest really in tech. I still don't, but it has an interest in me. So, we have to equalize that. So I'm not just an academic bystander, uh, but I don't think my involvement deprives me of dispassionate judgment. On the contrary, my hope is always that academic dispassion can help make statutory solutions more effective and constitutional. So this talk will focus on two things. First, the problem, and second, the possible solutions. Let's get these out of the way. It's important to start with a problem, and by the way, this is when we teach law, we, part of what we do is teaching how to write, and as you know, know in political theory, um, it's important to begin with a problem because only then can you see the need for the solution. You can have the right, too often people in law have solutions for problems that don't exist. So we better understand the problem before we proceed. So let's start with that problem. The difficulty, obviously, is censorship. It's government authorized censorship, by the way, and thus privatized government suppression. We'll get to that later. But let's start with a modest proposition that at the very least, it's censorship by private companies. On that, there can be no doubt. Some examples may be illuminating. We all have our own pet examples. I'm just gonna throw out a few. The political instances are myriad. Uh, remember the story about Hunter Biden's laptop? It was actually a little distasteful, so maybe you didn't wanna follow through all the details. Uh, but when that came out, it was promptly suppressed. Um, after, remember the riots at the Capitol? Whatever you think about those, Twitter shut down President Trump's account, shut down the president's account. Whatever you think about that president, it's quite something to shut down the president of the United States. Um, and in so doing, notice they censored not only his speech, but did something the Star Chamber never did. They actually permanently banned him. They said he may not come onto the platform again. That's rather interesting. And then there's another set of examples produced by COVID-19. COVID-19 affected our lives in many ways. 
Uh, but one thing it did was provide examples of censorship. Um, and these are interesting because they're as much scientific as political. Uh, my main involvement with censorship until now has been with scientific censorship, of which there's a lot in this country, by the way. We can talk about that in Q&A session. A lot of scientific study is censored in this country, quite apart from this tech censorship. So I was rather intrigued by this. In February 2020, and this is just one of many examples, Twitter banned a website called Zero Hedge for reporting the lab origins of the coronavirus. Zero Hedge has a lot of stories which range from the credible to the less credible. This was one of their more credible ones. In fact, anyone with even slight biological knowledge, mine is very slight, I assure you, but it's not entirely negligible. Anyone who had that slight biological knowledge knew very early on that lab negligence was certainly a possibility here, if not probable. We can talk about why later, but it, it's not hard to understand. Twitter nonetheless silenced this as misinformation. In December 2021, the American Heart Association posted the results of a scientific study on Twitter. That is not political, you would have thought. That is scientific. The study showed that mRNA injections increase the risk of heart disease. And by this time, we all know that, in fact, that's a, that's a real possibility. This wasn't false information. Um, it was scientific information that subsequently has been verified. Twitter impeded access to the tweet by putting a warning on it that it was an unsafe link, as if a statistical post contained a computer virus, which it didn't. This was not an unsafe link in the ordinary sense. Perhaps most strangely, humors come under attack. And here we're getting almost at Soviet levels of suppression. USA Today declared Rachel Levine Woman of the Year. Fair enough. The Babylon Bee promptly said that Levine was Man of the Year. Take your choice. I don't really care what you think about it. I don't even care what I think about it. It's not what's actually relevant here. The point is that USA has the right to say this, and the Babylon Bee has the right to say this but apparently not. Twitter this week suspended the B on the theory that its humorous speech was, quote, hateful conduct that promotes violence. Really? Uh, the B responded with this headline, Babylon spokesman finally banned from Twitter after sharing Babylon, sorry, Taliban spokesman finally banned from Twitter after sharing Babylon B headline. <laughs> you see, Twitter, Twitter allows the Taliban, really. Uh, but it censors the Babylon Bee for promoting violence. And it's not just the Taliban. We can run through terrorist groups. So I'm not going to bore you with more examples, although that would be lots of fun. You get the idea, and we already know all of this. The key generalization to draw from this is that the censorship is not merely political. It's also cultural, it's religious, and it's scientific. And it affects, yes, yes, it affects the outcomes of elections. The Hunter Biden laptop suppression had a profound effect on politics. We cannot kid ourselves about that. But that's only part of it. Uh, perhaps most centrally, this censorship impedes the sharing of scientific information. It targets traditional religious belief. It silences dissenting moral views, views that once, even three years ago, were considered utterly conventional, are now unspeakable. You're just not allowed to mention them. And the overt censorship is not the full extent of it, unfortunately, because the fear of being censored, the chilling effect, leads many commentators to self-censor, to quiet themselves down, to avoid being targeted. Maybe I should just not say that, because I don't want to lose my Twitter account, or I don't want to be deplatformed, or I don't want to be de demonetized. Many people depend upon their writing for their income. They also want to get their ideas out. If you just go beyond the line, wherever it is, you're not quite sure where it is, perhaps that you will no longer have an opportunity. So the overt censorship produces self-censorship, and this magnifies the overall effect. I'll add one more element to this, which is very interesting. Um, if you think about what censorship in the 17th century, and it, 17th century, by the way, is my home base. That's what I study. I love it. Um, but it's not pretty sometimes. Censorship in the 17th century, you think, ah, the punishment there is different from the offense. In other words, if you publish something, Galileo publishes something that was disapproved of, and it's a complicated story, by the way, with Galileo, but leave that aside. If you publish something that's disapproved of, the punishment is you'll go to prison. Uh, if you publish something that the, uh, the stationer's company of the Star Chamber doesn't approve of, 
You might pay a fine. These are different things. But the natural way for a censoring body to punish people is actually different, and we see that in America. Namely, if you, via, if you publish without permission in the case of institutional review boards, which we can talk about later, or if you publish in a violation of the rules of Twitter, the punishment is you can't publish anymore. The punishment is to deprive you of the very opportunity to publish. So if you care about publishing, it's not just that there's a rule, there's a punishment that might deprive you even in a profound way from publishing. Well, so much for the problem. Um, but let's dig in a little bit deeper and ask a question before we get to the solution. What's wrong with censorship? Perhaps there's something to be said for it, right? You've been all been in conversations where someone's going on and on, yakking away, it's usually a family member, and you think, okay, there's the food and there's a conversation. I'd rather have the food. Why don't they just shut up? And telling someone to shut up is something you can't always do, but when you can, that might be very useful. And of course, if they're saying something that's pernicious, maybe it's actually wholesome to tell them to shut up. You know, if information's false, if it's misinformation, it should be suppressed. If an, inf or an opinion provokes unjustified opposition to government and its policies, perhaps it's dangerous, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, so let's just talk about the costs of censoring opinion, even false opinion. You know, it's one thing to stand up for true belief. You know, think about all the folks in the past who have been martyred for standing up for true belief. But I don't want to do something different here, which is stand up for false belief, right? Because if we don't know, if there isn't God right here to tell us what's true and false, or some super committee of scientists, not that they always get it right, of course, um, Maybe we have to stand up for false belief. So a philosophical account of what's wrong with censorship appears in John Stuart Mill's 1859 essay on liberty. I don't want to praise John Stuart Mill too much, uh, but, well, he's, that's another story. Um, but John Stuart Mill is not unintelligent, and he said some things that are very valuable, and he analyzed censorship and offered three reasons why it's dangerous, and I just want to explore these. First, censorship will often suppress true opinion. No one has a monopoly on truth, right? So censors are apt to make mistakes. And by the way, this is why English censorship ended in 1695. Um, a censor was imposed, uh, uh, one of their censors turned out to be foolish, and he started censoring the wrong things. He became a laughing stock, and then Parliament abandons licensing of the press. And you know, this is a problem we've seen in recent years. In politics, we have the censorship of Hunter Biden's laptop. Lo and behold, this week it's been announced by the New York Times, oh, whoops, that story may have been correct. That story will turn out, I think, to be important for what happens in Ukraine, for what happens in this country. That's, that story is the fulcrum of American politics in ways we don't fully understand yet, and that's a little worrisome. In science, much information, for example, about vaccine risk has been suppressed, also about therapeutics. The result has been to adversely affect treatments and public policy. You should talk to doctors in this field. They're more than a little worried about it. That means the tech platforms are culpable for avoidable medical errors. Um, in other words, in medicine, the suppression of true opinion can be lethal. Second, let's get to the error. Suppression of error is also dangerous because when one's confronted by erroneous opinion, it forces one to tighten one's understanding of the truth. We all need challenges to our views. It helps us even when we think, oh, you know, that's a good point, but actually I'm still right. As you go through that process, you sometimes narrow your claim. You tighten it up. You think of the reasons for it you hadn't thought of before. You begin to understand better why you're right. By the way, that's one of the reasons I'm here today. Tomorrow, I, this institution has done a great blessing for me. I'm going to have some colleagues here read a manuscript and tell me why I'm wrong. My hope is at the end of the meeting that I'll think, well, they had some really good points, but my, my manuscript still survives, but in altered form. Um, there's a saying amongst academics, the best thing you can do for someone is to tell them that they're wrong before they publish. Right? <laughs> That's what this is about. One wants to know where one's wrong so you can get it right. And then third, leaving aside the dangers of suppressing the truth and suppressing error, there's an interesting point that Mill makes that most human opinion is apt to consist of half-truths. Uh, we can put this scientifically, that we are 
limited cognition, you can put it religiously, none of us are God. So necessarily, uh, what we say is not going to be complete truth. And that means the advancement of truth often comes by combining these partial truths. So we must allow publication of partial truths as the pathway to more complete ones. This gets to some of the political censorship. Some of the stuff that's suppressed seems uh, at the edge of credibility, one might even say profoundly false. And yet even the people who make utterly false statements, recklessly false statements, are coming from somewhere. There's something that affects them that leads them to say this. And to understand that they're saying it and why they see that the world that way actually is highly informative. If one wants to persuade someone, one wants to know about that so you can bring them along and get them to moderate their views. One needs to, and there might even be a partial truth there. So well, we need to go into detail. You get the idea. So these are Mill's three reasons for preserving freedom of, of speech. Now you might respond, yeah, 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 but we're dealing just with private censorship, not government censorship, so this really isn't so bad. Um, now whether it's really merely private is an open question. We can talk about that later. I don't want to go down that route right now. Um, because the private character of censorship doesn't make it less dangerous. Even private suppression can hide the truth. Even that can hurt individuals and our society. And again, John Stuart Mill is very relevant. He opposed government censorship, but he thought private suppression was even worse. We can debate that. There are reasons for going either way in that debate. But what's interesting is he understood that the tyranny of government is often more than matched by the tyranny of a majority because their control, he says, penetrates deeper into society. The argument, by the way, on the other hand, that government suppression is worse is that you have a concentration of that power. So each is bad in its own way. But this is what he said. A majority, or those who act in its name, can threaten free speech not only through government, but also more, even more effectively through the private efforts of those in society who demand conformity. Protection, therefore, against the tyranny of the magistrate is not enough. There needs all protection also against the tyranny of the prevailing opinion and feeling against the tendency of society to impose, by means other than civil penalties, its own ideas and practices as rules of conduct on those who dissent from them. In short, we need protection from private as well as government censorship. Uh, we can suffer the effects of censorship even when the censorship isn't from government and the First Amendment doesn't help us. So that's the problem we face. And it's different from the censorship of your company. You know, if you work for a company, there's some things they may not want you to say. If you're a professor at a university, you don't really want to go around saying the university doesn't need to be funded, right? These are sort of limit someone's speech in many circumstances from private companies. But the censorship by dominant communications platforms who control communications for most Americans, that's at a larger scale. So we should ask with Lenin, what is to be done? Um, fortunately, we have more lawful mechanisms than he. What are effective, lawful, and appropriate solutions? Now, there are many possibilities. Some are very personal, right? For example, we all could be better people. Um, all of us, including the tech platforms and their employees, could be less quarrelsome, more tolerant, more respectful, more modest about their own capacities. That'd be a much better world. It'd be very nice. But let's not count on that, right? <laughs> let's get real. Uh, so instead, let's explore some legal solutions. Uh, I'm just going to mention three. There'll be others we can take up in Q&A. First, I'm going to talk about litigation under pre-existing state or federal law. Second, let's talk about congressional repair, a federal statute protecting free speech. And then third, possibility of a state statute protecting free speech. So first, litigation under pre-existing law. This could work. Such litigation could work, but there are obstacles. And by the way, I should say, I particularly have been thought about this because this is how I got into the business. I was asked to undertake such litigation, not to do it personally. I've never actually argued in court, but I oversee a lot of litigation and plan it. And I was asked to take this under my wing, as it were. The problem is there are difficulties. One difficulty is that tech money flows through large law firms. Um, and that means it's difficult to put together a pro bono legal team to fight the censorship. I can't even begin to tell you how important this is. That money's everywhere. One needs a substantial legal team to litigate these cases. And most, you know, on the other side, you know, imagine having a billion dollars for your, your litigation costs. There's no limit to the number and quality of lawyers on the other side. That's not to demean them, on the contrary. They're admirable, but there are a lot of them. 
Um, and most big law firms have conflicts of interest. They already have tech money or they would like to have it. They want those conflicts or they, or they already have them. And by the way, um, this is not an accident. I'm quite confident tech money is spread around not only through think tanks but also through litigation outfits um, with, a, with, you know, with, a, with a plan. Another difficulty is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. There's a federal statute that bars much litigation against the tech platforms. We all should have such protection, but actually it's only the tech companies that have it, oddly enough. It says that they cannot be treated as publishers of the information they convey, so you can't sue them for what they include. So if they include defamatory information about you, you can't sue them. Okay. Then text Section 230 also says they should not be liable for the material that they exclude or censor. So they're neither liable for what they include nor for what they exclude. Um, on the exclusion side, they're not liable as long as it falls in a congressional list of suppressible content, including what the platforms find objectionable, which is a capacious <laughs> label. Um, which means you, you really can't sue them for much of anything, it would seem. Now, as it happens, Section 230 does not actually provide this much protection. Uh, when I first got into this, uh, I ended up writing something for the Wall Street Journal uh, about a year and about 14, 15 months ago. And I kept looking for academic literature interpreting Section 230. It's not there. No one had ever actually sat down to interpret the statute textually. And that turned out to be an interesting process. Um, suffice it to say, the courts who casually, I dare one say even recklessly, have declared 230 provides broad immunity, um, they're misreading 230. But because of their broad interpretation, so many courts have actually said this, it makes litigation against the tech platforms an uphill struggle. 230 is an obstacle at least until it gets knocked down, either held unconstitutional or interpreted more sensibly. Well, uh, are there litigation pathways that would avoid Section 230? One would be the so-called public forum doctrine. The Supreme Court has said that some dominant private companies are public forums, and so under the First Amendment, they cannot suppress speech. Uh, the typical example of this, Marsh versus Alabama, is a company town, where the company has so much control over the lives of the people there that it's essentially substituted itself for government. And then there's also a case called Pruneyard coming out of California, um, uh, which applies this to a shopping mall and the distribution of leaflets there. Another approach would be to recognize the tech platforms are actually cooperating with government to suppress speech. There is some case law suggesting this cooperation could make the cooperating companies state actors. Uh, now, there are cases that say that's circuit court cases that deny that, but Supreme Court cases actually support this theory, and if you want to read about it, Jeb Rubenfeld and Vivek Ramaswamy have written about it. Um, but it's, it's a sort of recondite theory, and you mention it to most circuit court judges, they'll, they get a bit uncomfortable. It takes them beyond their comfort zone. The cleanest pathway around Section 230 is to sue the government, not the tech companies, for pressuring the tech com platforms to suppress speech. See, when the Federal government is responsible for the censorship. Perhaps it is vulnerable under the First Amendment. That's the cleanest litigation. Now, where does this suppression from the government happen? Well, 230, Section 230 itself is part of the problem. It privatizes censorship. It privileges tech platforms when they restrict expression in accord with a congressional list of censorable materials. Well, that makes 230 itself an abridgment of the freedom of the speech. What's more, the federal government has pressured the platforms to suppress speech, and there's increasing evidence, some of it just came out this morning of this, where um, a government official will speak, and then you can notice uh, declines in clicks on various websites. It's a sort of, it was a remarkable coincidence of timing. We want to do discovery on this to figure out just how substantive the factual foundation is, but it's intriguing. There's enough there at least to speculate about it, but one doesn't know enough yet. Um, but these are all workarounds to get past 230 that are not immediately practicable for the ordinary person who has been censored. If you have a website and it's been shut down, you're not gonna undertake this litigation. This is complicated litigation. It makes judges, some of the theories make judges uncomfortable. It requires a large legal team. It's not going anywhere for your average person who gets told to shut up. So we need some better, more practicable solution than this sort of litigation under existing law. So let's turn to a second possible solution, congressional re repair. If you've got a difficulty, go to Congress. They'll fix it. 
Um, well, yes, it is a national problem. Congress, I suppose, in theory, could fix it. But let's pause. Congress itself created much of the problem by adopting Section 230. So it doesn't have a good track record on this stuff. Um, and in Congress, as opposed to state legislatures, the tech platforms have the most concentrated lobbying power. If you, if you are a tech company and you have billions to spend and you want to cut off any intrusion on your power, where will you want to do it? The forum you want is Congress. That's where you can get a good investment. I'm not talking about bribery. I'm just talking about, you know, lubricating ideas with a dinner or two or other such things. There are many things that can happen in these meetings. So one cannot trust Congress to solve the problem. And in any case, I have a principled objection. There are constitutional objections to le le congressional legislation on speech. The Constitution has no power over speech. It has a right against speech, but no power over speech. And in fact, the Constitution was drafted precisely to avoid giving Congress any regulatory power over speech. It's the most widely circulated pamphlet uh, during the ratification controversy was James Wilson's so-called State House Yard speech. And she says, don't worry, you anti-federalists. Really, stop worrying. There is no, you, you say we need a Bill of Rights containing free speech protections, but there is no power over speech in the federal constitution. He says, there is nothing like the congressional power to regulate Congress vis-a-vis -vis speech or literary productions and the like. So it's not even with an expanded power over, con over commerce, it's not clear to me that Congress has a lawful power over speech. So to ask them to act in that regard seems to me unprincipled. I certainly would not do it. So congressional repair may be more of a fantasy than a reality, and certainly not a principled one. And that leaves us with a third possibility state free speech statutes. Can a state civil rights statute prohibit the censorship? And that's what I want to focus on now. Now, I don't want to talk about all possible state anti-censorship statutes. For example, the Florida statute was very poorly drafted. Um, uh, it would make a great exam question, except that it's too easy. Um, you know those torts exams where you're meant to do issue spotting? That's what the Florida statute is like. It's not that it's entirely unconstitutional. Some of it's constitutional, but there are a lot of problems in there. By the way, I never taught torts. I teach contracts. And, con um, and one of the reasons I like contracts is there's a, some semblance of law left there. It's not just issue spotting. So in, let's not talk about Florida. What I want to talk about instead is what can be accomplished by carefully drafted statute, in particular, I hope, the Texas free speech statute. It's known as HB 20, if you want to look it up. Um, the Texas statute does the following. I'm just going to summarize it very quickly. It finds that the tech platforms, the really big ones, are common carriers. Just a finding there. It bars them from censoring on the basis of viewpoint. It leaves them free to restrict on basis of content. For example, it can restrict unlawful and unwholesome contact without rubbing up against the statute. And it provides only the mildest of remedies. It's as gentle as can be. You can only get injunctive declaratory relief, not damages. So you can be censored for violent or pornographic content. But if you're censored for your viewpoint, you can sue the tech platform. You won't get damages, but you can get your speech reinstated. And if you're a reader, you can also get the speech reinstated because, re because readers are affected adversely too. Now what's wrong with this? One possible objection is that this violates the free speech of the platforms themselves. They have a right to speak, and they don't want to include some of the stuff. So why shouldn't they be able to exclude it? But this sort of statute protects our free speech without limiting the speech of the platforms. The platforms are communications common carriers. How many, put up your, how many of you have heard, even heard of a common carrier before? OK, that's pretty good. Um, what does that mean? What is a common carrier? Um, what it means is that they supply conduits for others. A bus company is a common carrier. Taxi ca companies can be treated as common carriers, right? The telephone company is a common carrier. In other words, we have common carriers for people, for goods, and we also have common carrier, you know, FedEx for goods. We also have common carriers for communications. Telegraph was treated this way in the 19th century telephone in the tw early 20th, radio. 
Um, they supply conduits for the speech of others. So when the statute bars the companies from viewpoint discrimination in those conduits, it's only preventing them from censoring the speech of others that are using their buses, as it were. It's not limiting the companies in their own speech. So if uh, YouTube, for example, wants to condemn somebody's speech, they're free to do so. But that doesn't mean they can bar them. They can discriminate against on the basis of viewpoint, saying don't get on the bus. This sort of anti-discrimination restriction on common carriers was traditionally imposed not only by statute, but even by common law. Traditionally, this, you didn't even get, have to have a statute. Just by common law, a judge would find a common carrier, you may not discriminate. And it's been applied to communications common carriers since the 19th century without any constitutional doubts. So over 150 years of doctrine on communications common carriers supports the view that the Texas statute does not violate the First Amendment. Interestingly, the platforms themselves have said, and this is Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, they themselves say that they're not publishers. Under Section 230, you see, they're treated as not publishers to protect them from liability. So there are countless cases, I can't even recite them all to you, in which they vehemently say, we are not publishers, you can't treat us as publishers. That defies reality, it defies federal law. And now they say, oh no, we're publishers, we're choosing what we publish on our platforms. <laughs> um, so they're in a bit of a bind here. There's actually a doctrine called a judicial estoppel, where you're not allowed to say one thing out of one side of your mouth and something else out of another side of your mouth in different cases. So it's a little awkward for them, I think, on that. Uh, the platforms, they're called platforms for a reason. They're not called publishers, they're called platforms because they're platforms for other people's speech. In their own speech, they're publishers and protected by the First Amendment. In carrying the speech of others, they're merely platforms. They're communications utilities, if you will, and can be barred from discriminating without interference. Um, and by the way, just to tie this in with some of the constitutional law you may know, um, if you're familiar with the history of anti-discrimination laws, they are profoundly dependent on this doctrine on common carriers. Why is that? The 14th Amendment, right, which you would have thought, you know, has something to say about equality, the Equal Protection Clause, um, that limits states. But what allows government to bar discrimination amongst private parties? Well, common carriage doctrine and the related doctrine of public accommodations. So, for example, Heart of Atlanta Motel, which is a case involving discrimination by a hotel. Um, this is a public accommodation. It's holding itself out to the public, just as a common bus company holds it out to the public. You cannot tell people to get to the back of the bus. You cannot tell them they cannot get on the bus. You're not even allowed to comment on them and say, hey, we disapprove of you for your color, your religion, because you wear glasses, for any reason whatsoever. So this, is de this, is, this argument is deeply embedded in our law. It's not just a little thing drawn out of the past. Now, there's another objection to the sort of statute adopted in Texas, uh, which is that it violates Section 230, which we talked about earlier. So let's say a little bit more about 230. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, remember, protects the tech platforms from liability for restricting material in a congressional list. I'm actually going to read it to you. I know it's tedious. Law is very tedious. But there's a certain pleasure in the details, so forgive me. Section 230C2 says, no provider or user of an interactive computer service, it took me about a month to wrap my mind around that phrase, shall be held liable on account of A, any action voluntarily taken in good faith to restrict access to or availability of material that the provider or user considers to be, and here's the list, obscene, lewd, levicious, filthy, excessively violent, harass, it sounds like good TV, right? harassing or otherwise objectionable, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected. There are, that's astonishing, right? Does this federal language mean that Texas cannot bar the censorship? In fact, the Texas statute, and I think any well-drafted statute in this area, will have two complete defenses to any violation of 230. First, the Texas statute merely bars viewpoint discrimination. Section 230, in contrast, provides a list of content that cannot be restricted. And that means 230 only protects the tech companies for the, their discrimination on the basis of content. In contrast, the statute bars only viewpoint discrimination, and so it doesn't collide with the statutory protection of 
content discrimination. The background to this, if you've done free speech law, is the Supreme Court has developed a doctrine that's deeply, deeply embedded that there's a distinction between content discrimination and viewpoint discrimination. I can talk more about why they've done this, but it's a very important free speech doctrine. And so when this statute is adopted and lists bar, uh, per, uh, permissible content discrimination, it cannot be understood to give protection to the companies for viewpoint discrimination. So that's one, so there's no collision between the statute, federal and state statute here. But there's another way in which there is no collision, another safety valve, if you will. The Texas statute provides for non-damages remedies. Why does that matter? When 230 protects companies from the word liability, it means liability only in the sense of damages actions, not other sorts of suits. Those of you who have taken contracts or torts will know there are multiple meanings for the word, word liability. Liability can mean your legal obligation to remedy something. So if you break a contract, or if you owe somebody, or, or, if, you, or if you hurt somebody, you know, you pull the rug from them and they hurt, break a leg, you're liable to them in the sense of you have a legal obligation to them. But liability can also have much narrower meaning. It can just mean money damages. It could be the money you owe them. So what's going on in the statute? Um, Section 230 makes quite clear, I won't bore you with the construction here, but make, it differentiates its causes of action and liability, which makes quite clear that when it talks about liability, it only means damages. It does not mean barriers to lawsuits that are not seeking damages. So there's no conflict with 230 when the Texas statute offers non-damages remedies. The Texas free speech statute therefore does not conflict with 230. That's a distraction. Um, I'll say one more thing about 230, just to have a sense of just how dangerous it is, and then I'll call it quits. Um, get, let's get back to that language, that no provider, blah, 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 shall be liable on account of actions to restricting obscene, lewd, lavicious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable material, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected. What on earth was Congress doing there? What it's doing is it's telling companies, you can suppress stuff, and no one will have a legal remedy against you that really matters, damages. Um, and this is the list of stuff you can get away with doing this for. And we're gonna, so you're getting a privilege, some sort of legal protection, for suppressing material that we think is bad that should be suppressed. And it doesn't matter whether it's constitutionally protected. In other words, Congress knew it was handing off what it could not do to private companies. This is the privatization of censorship and it's obscene. That's what's really obscene here. And by the way, the First Amendment addresses this. You know what the primary example of what the First Amendment was aimed at? The very 17th century licensing we talked about earlier. You know how that was done? The Star Chamber and then Parliament um, authorized licensing, but it didn't do it itself. It handed it off to the stationer's company and the universities. In other words, the primary example of what the First Amendment bars is privatized censorship. So, Section 230 itself is of very dubious constitutionality. But we won't go too far down that rabbit hole. I just, I just want to wrap up here. Just to sum up, freedom of speech is in danger, and it, it's at risk not only from government, um, but also more immediately from the tech platforms themselves. And this private danger, is, although it's not prevented by the First Amendment, is still highly, highly dangerous. Unfortunately, there's an easy and I think entirely constitutional solution, which are state statutes which can bar discrimination by communications common carriers. That's what Texas has been done, and we'll see now whether the courts understand the law and uphold it. So thank you. Terrific. Uh, we have a uh, tradition here in the program, which we invite our undergraduate students to ask the <coughs> question. Okay, so Abraham, introduce yourself. Hi, thank you so much, Professor. My name is Abraham Figueroa. I'm a Tocqueville Fellow here. Um, my question would be more uh, geared more towards in, um, intermediaries, uh, like GoDaddy.com, for example, who host these platforms, who um, have these content, um, which um, may violate certain policies by certain corporations. What should the role of these intermediaries who provide certain platforms for these individuals to host websites that have um, hateful content, for example, mm -hmm. how should the government go about um, allowing them to either step aside um, outside of Section 230, or should they also be responsible for content moderation? 
Oh my. So, that, that, um, so there are layers to this question. That's a very good question. Uh, and I, my first answer will be I haven't thought enough about it. I've been so focused on the big tech platforms, I haven't thought about the intermediaries as you describe them. Uh, but ignorance has never stopped an academic from moving forward. Uh, but let, let's at least consider some, some of the considerations here. So first of all, we should distinguish between constitutional problems, major constitutional problems, and non-constitutional problems. I'm not sure there's a constitutional issue here. Um, it's really a question of policy. Um, what would go into such policy considerations? For one thing, um, there's a question of, are there alternatives, right? So if you are, let's say, GoDaddy, uh, how dominant a player are you? I don't think they're the, the dominant. They're, they, they, there are a lot of these companies that can do this, right? So if there's no monopoly and not even any dominance here, I think we should be less concerned that a company would decide not to permit some sort of speech there, right? Um, should, could they be treated as common carriers? They might, it might be that they could. Whether they should be is another matter altogether. Um, so I don't have a strong opinion on this. I'd have to think more about it. Um, I would say I have one general assumption about this stuff, which is less is more. Um, so even in the Texas statute, my concern, to the extent I was involved, um, was always actually to have a minimal statute, to do as little as possible. Um, other people wanted more. Um, and I can't say that I prevailed in other parts of the statute, but at least on the anti-discrimination section, the goal was, and I think I succeeded there, was to keep it as small as possible, um, to have minimal uh, reach, minimal remedies, um, and to interfere as little as possible in the activities of these companies, which are quite remarkable. We should not kid ourselves that these companies have done extraordinary things. So, but that doesn't really answer your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, another student question? Okay. Um. Hey, Professor, thank you very much for speaking to us today. Um, my name is Sean Tian. I'm a Topher Fellow here and a senior. Um, last year in Biden v. Knight First Amendment Institute, he talked uh, about different pathways uh, in, uh, academics and future litigators may go down, and one of them was uh, public accommodations. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you have any thought on This is Thomas's uh, concurrence. Right. Yeah. Um, that was very interesting. I assume that's a conversation as much with his colleagues on the court as with us, right? Alerting them to this is an issue that's coming the way, let's start thinking about it. Um, it was, I thought, very useful. Uh, be, this is a concurrence in which Thomas essentially just laid out textbook law on common carriers, saying, look, there's this doctrine on common carriers, it may be relevant here, this is the degree of applicability and so forth. And we can, one can there's elements, you know, what constitutes a common carrier, that's something that, uh, you know, we can have a conversation about because there are many possible characteristics. It could, you could say people are common, companies are common carriers by function, the small bus company. You could say that they're common carriers because they receive government privileges. And by the way, obviously 230 is a great privilege for these companies, um, not to mention the fair use doctrine that the companies get. Um, and then there's common carrier by do virtue of dominance, which is what the, sta the Texas statute adopts. Um, companies that have over 50 million users of the course of a month. Okay. Um, and you can add to that list, but he discusses all of this. I thought that was useful simply in the sense that he's exploring, just laying out textbook law, saying, gee, we should pay attention to this. Um, I don't think it was an advisory opinion or anything like that, but I thought it was useful in alerting people I mean, the reality is, when someone like myself writes an op-ed, a few people will read it. When someone like Thomas writes a concurrence, that actually gets taken very seriously. So I was grateful for that. Can I ask a small just clarification? Why the minimalism on the remedies in HB 20? And why did you advocate? I mean, so I, I tweet out, you know, Philip Hamburger speaking on how to uh, fight back against big tech, and then Twitter uh, removes it. <laughs> why, why is only the remedy? Oh, you can right. your tweet can be posted, after you know right. three days after the lecture happens. Right. What you know? Why can't I get twenty right. million dollars? Right. So for right. So for reason for re <laughs> yes, if you wish. Um, so um, for for reasons uh, that I was alluding to about the conflicts with two thirty, I actually think one could have out sought one could have provided for damages. That's right. Um, because 230 only deals with content discrimination, 
And because the statute such as this only deals with viewpoint discrimination by the companies, there is no conflict, in which case you could allow for damages. That's right. So why not? Why not get more? Uh, there are a number of reasons. One, I don't want anyone to be under the impression that the tech companies are somehow the underdog here, that they're going to be hurt. This isn't about extracting money from them. It's about high principle. And I think the atmospherics matter profoundly. And I think it's very useful to be able to go into court and say, this is a minimal statute. This is the Mind you, common carry regulation is draconian. You could, we could have done rate setting, right? If the companies really want common carry regulation, they want to fight it, that's OK. There can be rate setting. That's not what I want. Um, and I want, to make it, I want it to be demonstrative in the mildness of what's being sought here. Um, second, um, although I made an argument a minute ago about why there's no conflict here with 230, judges cannot be expected to get everything right. So I wanted a double-barreled defense. I want at least two arguments why there's no conflict with 230, and that requires leaving out the damages. Now, what does this mean as a practical matter? Suppose Philip gets excluded from his Twitter account. Um, I didn't know you did Twitter. Um, and he wants a remedy. The remedy is simply to go to court and demand to be reinstated. You might have to litigate for that. But after a while, that litigation, the first few cases will be complicated. After the first dozen, it won't be. And they will have a day or two to reinstate you. If they don't, they're in contempt of court. And then large amounts of money can be requested. You won't get it. But you won't. Now, once this is all established, if the companies are still resisting, yes, damages should be considered. But I suspect they won't resist after a while. So that's unnecessary. I, and it, I just add, you know, one doesn't want to see this as a, a us versus them. One wants to actually get things done in a minimalistic way because it's politically palatable. You can persuade judges. And we all have to live with one another. I, yes, it would be fun to crush one's oppressor, oppressors. You may think that way. I don't see the world that way. And I think it's dangerous to litigate that way or to plan litigation that way. One wants to plan to win. And to win means being moderate. I'll just one, throw in one more thing. Um, and this, this gets to what we do as academics. So if you're thinking about being academic, think about this. Um, when I present a paper, do I want to go in guns blazing, saying he's wrong, he's wrong, she's wrong, and this is my big claim? No, you want to do the opposite. You want to make the most minimal claim possible that satisfies your, the needs of your argument because you do not need unnecessary opposition. You're going to get enough flack for getting things wrong. You don't need to magnify your troubles in life. So for all these reasons, why, no need for damages. As I rethink my academic career in Senate Director, <laughs> um, let's go to Blake, and then I'll come over to, to the other side of Professor Alfred. Hi, Professor. I'm Blake Ziegler. I'm one of the Tocqueville Fellows. I'm a junior. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier in the talk, you mentioned how like tech companies to an extent just have big law firms in their back pocket, so it doesn't really make sense to litigate them. Um, but in your solution for the state level laws, it seems uh, that you've presented, uh, and I don't mean to mischaracterize you, but the way it's been presented is it'll be very easy, easy at least after the first couple of times, uh, to get these tech companies to listen. Do you anticipate any challenges from the tech companies at the state level? And if so, how is that substantially easier than just right. litigating them in the normal right. way? Right. It's happening right now. That's right. So uh, after the statute is passed, um, unfortunately, actually, the statute uh, was framed in terms of private enforcement. Unfortunately, at the very last moment, I have no control over these things. It's like a little sh boat you put into a pond. And it, where it goes is out of your control after that. Someone asked, added an enforcement provision for the attorney general. That means that uh, the, the tech companies can sue the attorney general to, to get an injunction against enforcement. And that's exactly what happened in December. And they got a district court judge to issue a preliminary injunction, injunction against enf enforcement of the law. Not what I wanted, but one lives with it. So yes, that litigation is currently underway. I just finished filing an amicus brief just last week. Um, and what's interesting, of course, is that on the other side, you know, there's all the money in the world. On our side, we had 11 amicus briefs um, written mostly by individuals, including students, a doctor. Um, uh, David Mamet wrote, by the way. He wrote a two-page, I mean, the brief is long, but the, inside there's an essay by David Mamet, which is almost which is quite profound. 
Um, and by the way, if you're interested, and I'll get back to the question, um, galileosociety.org, galileosociety.org will lead you to all of those briefs, including David Mamet's essay. So you can be among the first people to read his quite remarkable essay. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an analogy, a metaphor of a very interesting sort. It's about the mental dislocation that follows when, when real experience and web experience don't align because of the censorship. Very, very interesting. Um, so it's just a ragtag bunch of individuals and odd think tanks that wrote on the side. So if you're doing it by the numbers, yes, we get crushed. If you do it by the intellectual contribution, I hope, our, our, as Demet Mamet uh, illustrates, we stand out. Um, but that is an obstacle even here. Uh, it's less of an obstacle because it's not, doesn't, this doesn't involve trial work. For the, you know, at the trial level, with the discovery, you need a team. For this, we can manage because it's just, it's just appellate work. Uh, Professor Alford? Yeah. Uh, Roger, if you could use the microphone. Yeah. I teach antitrust, and I'm so very familiar with this space. Most of my colleagues in the antitrust world view censorship as a second order effect to the deeper problem of the monopoly dominant right. market power of these platforms. So we're not, we don't worry about censorship on mm -hmm. cable television because there's multiplicity of voices, right? We don't worry about GoFundMe uh, shutting down the Canadian truckers because there's an alternative mechanism to fund the Canadian truckers. With uh, these platforms, are we are deeply concerned that Parler can be completely deplatformed by all of the other dominant players, right? And so you could say censorship is really a second order effect to the dominant power of these companies. And what you really need is either legislation or litigation that will break up these companies similar to the Federal Trade Commission's action against Facebook or the litigation, both the DOJ and the states suing Google uh, for their dominance. And once you get multiplicity of voices available in the marketplace, then you don't care so much if one particular platform is closing you right. off because there's alternative voices and <coughs> ways to, to do that. And, and so there is, I won't go into the details because of the time, but there's legislation and litigation that are trying to deal with these right. kinds of sort of issues. Yeah, it, that, I think that's a very, very important point. Um, let's begin, I have two thoughts on this. One involves what we should worry about, and it may be that people in antitrust worry about different things than people in the free speech area. Um, so for example, a small bus company doesn't have a monopoly, let's say, but one still wouldn't want it to discriminate. So there, there may be discrimination that one doesn't want, even from not merely not monopolies, but not even dominant players. So there, there are multiple considerations here. But let's get past that, because I think the larger point you're making is true, that there's this profound interrelationship between some degree of dominance or even monopoly status and the discrimination. Um, you know, if one applied that to racial discrimination, it would mean you know, that would less concerned about racial discrimination because there are other avenues. I'm not sure I'd go down that route uh, for the reasons I explained, but it is interesting. We There'd be less worry about the speech discrimination, the viewpoint discrimination, if there weren't this degree of monopoly effect. Uh, I don't have any substantive thing to add to that. I thought you put it very persuasively, but I do want to mention one element here that's quite struck me in all of this. Um, I've been astonished by the, I don't want to say the lack of understanding, maybe they see things I don't, but the lack of understanding about these issues amongst the lawyers on the other side with tech companies. The tech companies made at the district court for uh, arguments about free speech that were not admirable. I don't want to be too hard on them, but this is, this, the, it was poorly argued and the district court judge adopted some of those poor arguments with a net effect that that did not help their cause. That's extraordinary. A lot of well-paid lawyers are not necessarily the ones thinking things through the best. When you take it up a level to what you're talking about, what I think they're missing is the interrelationship between these issues. I've been quite a, you know, think about the issues on the minds of big tech. Suppose you're a sentient lawyer for big tech. What are you worried about? You want to stay whole. You don't want to be broken up antitrust-wise. That's very important to you. You want to be able to strip people of their data and use it. So you want to be protected in that. And you want to censor people. What's the most important thing to you in all of this? It's in that order. You don't want to be broken up and you want people's data. Otherwise, you don't have a business. 
Censorship is just, it, it's like icing on the cake. So what are they doing fighting on all fronts? I don't understand that. They're saying, we're going to censor you, we're going to strip you of your data, and we're going to marry you in whole. I don't think that works that way. Because if you think about the demands, the antitrust demands, the demands to break up these companies, the resentments of the popular sort against these companies, it comes because people think, oh, I've been oh, all my data's been taken. They're looking into my bedroom. They're looking into my innermost thoughts. I don't like that. Um, and they're also being told, shut up. You can't talk about things. I don't think you can tell people to shut up and take their data and remain whole. And so I think they've made a strategic mistake of a profound sort along the lines that you're talking about. Um, if, they want to, if they win, suppose they actually win in this lawsuit and they can, they can continue to censor us. And suppose in addition they continue taking our data. I think the political, I think that's politically explosive. So I actually, I'm, again, I'm a minimalist. I don't, I don't view these companies as necessarily evil, but they can't have their cake and eat it too. But in a way, it's one thing to be a pig. To be a hog is kind of dangerous. People resent it. I don't know if you agree with this or not. I'd be curious on your views, but. I agree that, that you can imagine a lot of companies that are not monopoly powers that can still engage in really nefarious, and it really matters. Right. We, we see it on the university campus. Right? None of these campuses have a monopoly power. Right. Right. But doesn't the censorship by political cover, so you can do one and two, take data and stay together? Right, because it, it allows you to, yeah. I, I mean, the censorship ap appeases very powerful people. Right. 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 Um, so it's a package. Isn't even it? in the Soviet Union, things couldn't be kept quiet. Right? People knew what was going on. Not fully, not completely, but there's word of mouth. I, I, I think they're overplaying their hand. But you know, I'm not their lawyer. <laughs> More questions in. Yeah. Professor O'Connor. Uh, I'm Dave O'Connor. I'm in the philosophy department. <clears throat> so my uh, the centrality of law in my thinking is rather less than in yours. <laughs> and so the nervous laughter or maybe amused laughter when you mentioned Lenin's question to me is not laughing. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a very serious question of whether there is a solution to these things within the m manipulation of the legal apparatus. And your own work on the arbitrary prerogative of the administrative state has had some influence on my pessimism about some of these things. Uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but just as your everyday citizen, my impression is that the regulation of common character of common carriers probably mostly falls into the hands of regulatory agencies that look more like the arbitrary prerogatives and the institutional capture machines that uh, your uh, wonderful books have exposed as threats to the constitutional order rather than as supports for them. So that the minimalist strategy in Texas looks to me like a way to uh, actually institutionalize in an extra constitutional way the very powers that you're hoping to oppose. So Lenin's question, what is to be done, is unlikely to be answered by the creation of yet another layer of the administrative state. So I'll, I'll say, first, I am flattered to have a philosopher here, um, if even also a little bit intimidated, because we lawyers know we're not philosophers. Uh, so first as to Lenin, um, that's right, this is serious. I don't like being serious about all things all the time. I like to have a little bit of levity. But no, there are very serious issues here. Um, we have, with the court's approval, developed a system of government, administrative governance, that is not going to end well. And if the courts don't deal with it, there will be popular reaction. We've already seen some of this. People will say, well, this is unhappiness with government. No, it's unhappiness with the unlawful element of our government. It's not really our government. It's, it's, it's some, uh, something terrible that's been appended to it. Um, and one of my goals is precisely to find legal remedies for this. I, you know, I have a civil rights organization that litigates against ministry of power because if we don't get rid of it through the courts, there are going to be tensions that will be unbearable. And the whole goal is to avoid those, those tensions to lessen them. 
Now, have I fallen into a trap here um, by, by pursuing in one project what violates another one? Um, I hope not, and, but it, you, I think it's understandable why one would be worried about that. A lot of common carrier regulation runs through administrative agencies. Um, and that's particularly true of the intrusive common carrier regulation, the rate setting sort of reg regulation. And some states considering these sort of statutes actually have considered setting up administrative agencies. I, that's why I have no hair. I tear it out when I, when I hear about this. Um, but um, I'm glad to say at least the statute I was slightly associated with, the Texas statute, does not do that. It sets statutory standards and leaves the rest to litigation. Um, but you're absolutely right, there will be a temptation. There's always a temptation to use administrative agencies. Um, I don't understand it. Uh, I think it's goofy. I think it's unlawful. But people are people. <laughs> they do what they want. <laughs> Uh, professor, my name is John Snyder. I'm not an attorney, but I do happen to be a board member for the Institute for Free Speech, which you may be familiar with our work on the First Amendment. Um, your preferred of the three prongs of attack, you prefer the third one, the state level. Uh, at the second level, in con at, the, at the congressional level, you wouldn't be optimistic of any work, and in fact, they were, in your opinion, I think they're wrong in the first place when they enacted 230 because they don't have any authority on speech. My question is, in a perfect world, would you like to see Congress just eliminate Section 230? One of the reasons I ask the question is, I've heard some discussions that the minute we bring that topic back to Congress and you open up the subject matter, to your point of the boat in the lake, you don't know where it's going to end up. And we actually could end up with something where you went in for revocation or repeal, you'd end up with something actually worse than what we have today. Exactly. That's right. And bravo for your work and for free speech. I think that's admirable. Um, yes, I, I don't know. One has no idea what comes out of that process. And there's very much a possibility the tech companies will say, look, we're willing to give up a little here, but give us a little more over there. I've, I have no idea what will happen. I must say that my, my view on this is colored by an experience uh, back uh, some years ago. Uh, there's something called the RAINS Act, well, which is designed to allow uh, congressional review of administrative regulations. Now, I view it as unconstitutional because it actually inverses constitutional relationships. Normally, Congress makes a law and then the executive vetoes it. The RAINS Act would have the executive make law and then Congress occasionally would veto it. Um, but I was kind of curious what was being done with this and was puzzled no progress had been made with something so mild. So I went and talked to the administrative aides for the Congress people who are dealing with this. And after 10 minutes only, I just had an unpleasant sense and I just asked candidly, wait a minute, do you have any expectation of this being enacted? No, 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 this will never be enacted. Um, it's just a game. I have no interest in games. Um, and at this, you know, one of the blessings of this country is we still have 50 states. And there's still a few states that are willing to try out solutions. It's a work in progress, by the way. As one state senator, another state, said to me, she said, look, we don't know if this works. And we have some questions about it. And it doesn't do everything we want, the damages issue. Uh, but we'll learn as we go along. And I liked that attitude. We'll experiment modestly, see what happens. Maybe it will work, maybe it won't. And so I, I think that's both as a practical matter and as a principled matter the best approach at the moment. Uh, hi, Professor. Um, I'm Jack Ferguson. I'm a law student, uh, also a big fan of your work. I read your uh, book, Separation of Church and State, a few years ago. Um, I, I'm also very interested in Section 230, but the origin story and the goals of it that I'm familiar with are, I think, different from what you were describing. So um, I, I always understood Section 230 as promoting free speech rather than enabling it because the, the censorship, the political censorship we see is just the tip of the iceberg and these companies are taking down millions and millions of pieces of content, um, you know, like uh, pornographic content, uh, torture content, harassing content, um, all the, uh, you know, profanity, all this kind of bad stuff that would make the, the internet like a, a, a cesspool place to be. So while, um, you know, at some of the, the, the high profile political censorship 
uh, you know, I, I don't like, you know, on balance, if companies are shielded from uh, the litigation, you know, death by a thousand cuts for every time they take something down, you know, on balance, um, these uh, these platforms are greater places for free speech and dialogue that conservatives have really, really benefited from, um, you know, over the over the past few decades. So I wonder your, your thoughts and response to that. I think it's a very reasonable concern, and it, it's a it's a concern the companies raise too. They say, look, if you enact such a statute and it's upheld, the internet will be awash with porn. There will be terrorism uh, 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 advocated on the web and the like. Um, very reasonable concerns, but um, there's a small group of lawyers who have worked or do work in the Justice Department uh, with child pornography, sort of the worst of the worst. Um, you'll get very interesting stories about the cooperation of these companies and those prosecutions. Um, their servers, you know where they're located? United States? Indiana? No, they're in Ireland. That's not a coincidence. It's more difficult, actually, for the federal government to do what it needs to do to protect us if the servers are in Ireland. Um, I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. Suffice to say, I'm not sure these companies are that much opposed to even the worst of that content. Um, but is there a risk here? Well, I, it depends what you're, what you're worried about. If you're worried about types of content, pornography, regardless of its point of view, or terrorism, or violence, or something else, or even things that are just entirely innocuous, tea making. If you think making tea is offensive because you're a coffee drinker, all those things can be removed. There is no obligation on the, on the, in these companies under the statute to include any content that they don't want. The only thing they're barred from doing is from taking down content because of a disapproved point of view. So if you like some terrorism and don't like some other terrorism, then there's an issue, right? But if it's terrorism you don't like, you can take it all down. If it's violence you don't like, you can take down any category of violence. If it's pornography, you can take down any category of pornography. The statute does not bar those things. Now, there is the question of death by a thousand cuts, um, but that cuts two way, if you forgive me. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Um, so we all live that way, too. Most of us cannot afford to hire a lawyer just to draft a will. I can't. Really, I can't afford that. I do it myself. It may not be the best drafted will, but I'll do it myself. Um, I certainly can't hire someone to do litigation for me personally. That's too expensive. On the administrative state, I've got money and I can sue, and we're always looking for more money and more lawsuits. That's fun. But it's not, it's, it, most, these companies can afford a few lawsuits, right? And notice, once they figure out the law, that is viewpoint discrimination is barred, they can just avoid discriminating. And notice they don't pay a penny if someone points out to them, you've taken me off the web, please reinstate me. And they judge, oh, yeah, yeah, he's right. We did take someone off for viewpoint. So sorry, we're putting it back up. They don't pay a penny. So this is, this is an infinitely gentle statute. And it does not prevent them from removing material on the basis of content. So I, I think it's a good concern, but it's not, I think, applicable here. I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, please join me. And thank you thank all. You for the Great questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you, thank you so much.